Hello, in this final video we will be covering how to perform the receiver sensitivity test portion of compliance testing for USB 2.0 high-speed devices. For this test we will continue using the MSO 5204B oscilloscope TDS USB 2 device test fixture and high-speed electrical test tool host PC software from USB.org. In addition to this we will also be using a TDP 1500 active differential probe AWG 5012B arbitrary waveform generator and 1 meter phase mass SMA cables with SMA to BNC adapters. Here's a quick look at our hardware connections. The host PC is connected to the fixture via USB on port J32. Our DUT will be connected to port J28. The TDP1500 differential probe is connected from channel 1 on our scope to J25 differential pins. The AWG markers 1 and 2 outputs are connected to the SMA connectors J27 and J24 respectively. Switch S6 should be in the initialized position at the start of this test. Here's a quick shot of our test fixture fully connected. As before, you'll see that I have not yet connected my DUT to my test fixture. I'll be doing that later on in the testing when we need to determine what device ID we're using in the host PC software. Once all our connections are made, we need to copy the necessary USB test patterns from the oscilloscope to the AWG. The waveforms are installed in a folder on the scope along with the rest of the TDS USB 2 application software when installed. For Windows 7 oscilloscopes, these test patterns are located under the C directory, users, public, tektronics, tech applications, TDS USB 2, data gen. Now what we need for this are the in add one dot dtg file and min add one dot dtg file and i've already copied these from my oscilloscope to my awg for this testing so what you'll need to do is get a usb thumbstick or some other memory device copy these to that thumbstick and then transfer them to your awg to be loaded now that we've transferred our waveforms from our oscilloscope to our AWG, we need to import them into our AWG waveform list. So what I'm going to do is go to File, Import from File, make sure that the .dtg file format is selected since that's the file format for our patterns, and then load our two waveforms. So we're going to load the first one, the in add one .dtg first. It's going to prompt us to set AWG bits corresponding to the bit 0 and bit 1 marker bit patterns. So we're going to set bit 0 to AWG channel 1 marker 1 and bit 1 to AWG channel 1 marker 2. Click OK. You'll see this message pop up. Don't worry about it. Just click Yes. And now you can see here we have our waveform in our waveform list. I'm going to rename this real quick to N just to keep things organized. And then I'll go through the same process to import the second waveform we'll be using for our testing. Now in this test, the min waveform is used as a functional check of the USB device under test. What it is is the minimum packet length usable as per the spec that a USB 2.0 high-speed device should respond to. I'm going to rename this as well. And then we'll just take a quick look at both waveforms. So the in waveform, if we look at our markers down below, you can see that the pattern is quite long. In comparison to min, where the pattern is much shorter or it has fewer bits in the pattern. Like I said, this is the minimum number of bits in a USB packet that the USB device should respond to. Now before switching back to the oscilloscope we need to make sure that our timing is set correctly. Since we're doing USB 2.0 high speed we're going to set our sample rate to 480 meg or 480 megabits per second. Switching back to our host PC we need to now start up the high speed electrical test tool and put our DUT in the correct test mode. 
Once more, reminder that your host PC may have multiple PCI buses used for your various USB ports. Also remember that this software will take over all USB ports on that selected bus. If you still want control of other attached USB devices, you need to either make sure that those devices are attached to a different USB PCI bus, or use USB 3.0 ports or possibly PS2 ports instead. Now that we've selected the desired PCI bus, we need to identify our device under test. Simply plug in your device under test and click enumerate. You should see your device now pop up as a new device in your device list. Once we've found our new device, we're going to select the test underscore SEQ underscore NAK, apologies, SE0 underscore NAK device command and click execute to place the device into the proper test mode. I'm going to bring up the scope display so that you can see the response when I switch S6 from initialize to test. Here we see our USB test signal on our oscilloscope screen. Watch what happens to the signal when I switch S6 from initialize to test. So you can see we're going to have to scale our waveform accordingly to be able to see it clearly on screen. What I'm going to do is adjust my vertical scale first from 100 millivolts to 200 millivolts per division. I'm then going to adjust my horizontal scale from 10 nanoseconds per division to 100 nanoseconds per division. I'm also going to adjust my horizontal positioning about two major divisions to the left so that we can see both the send and receive packet from our DUT on screen. I'm going to then adjust my trigger level from zero volts to roughly 150 millivolts. Now as you can see I'm still not triggering quite stably so what I'm going to do is adjust one more thing in the trigger menu. I'm going to go and set my trigger hold off time from the default 250 nanoseconds to one microsecond. Now what this will do is ensure that I'm always going to be triggering on the packet from my AWG allowing me to see the response from my DUT without accidentally triggering on one of the subsequent edges before the next series of send receive packets occurs. What we're looking at here is what we discussed earlier, the min pattern. As you can see, once again, the pattern from the AWG is rather short in terms of the number of bits sent and with respect to our DUT, we see that we are constantly getting a response signal from it. The timing is a little bit unstable, but we are able to guarantee or confirm that we are seeing a response to every send packet from our AWG. Now that we've completed the functional check on our device under test, I'm going to load the in test packet into our waveform list for output. What I'm going to be doing in this test is adjusting the marker high, marker one high, and marker two high values to control the amplitude of our send packet to our DUT. What we'll be measuring is the amplitude of this packet and whether or not our DUT is able to respond. I'll be incrementally lowering these values until our DUT no longer responds to our send packet and then comparing that against the required values as per the USB spec. Here you can see our packet output from the AWG and the response from our device under test. According to test EL17 in the USB specification, a high-speed capable device must implement a transmission envelope detector that does not indicate squelch when a receiver exceeds plus or minus 150 millivolts differential amplitude or 300 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak centered around the midpoint plateau. In simpler terms, a high-speed capable device must be able to respond to packets when the high and low values are at least 150 millivolts from the midpoint. 
In addition to this test, EL-16 states a high-speed capable device must implement a transmission envelope detector that indicates squelch, i.e. never receives packets, when a receiver's input falls below plus or minus 100 millivolts differential amplitude. This means a high-speed capable device will, by design, not respond to any packets when the high and low values are less than 100 millivolts from the midpoint. What I'm doing here is configuring my high, low, and mean measurements for my signal on channel 1. Since we only care about the voltage level of the test pattern, we use cursors to gate our measurement region. The region selected will be the majority of the packet output from our AWG. Notice, once the cursors are configured, that our initial differential amplitude is about plus minus 300 millivolts, so well above the 150 millivolt specification that we'll be testing. The final portion of this test can be somewhat tedious. As mentioned, you will incrementally be decreasing your marker 1 and marker 2 output levels until your output signal reaches plus or minus 150 millivolts differential amplitude or your device fails to respond consistently. Each marker output will have to be adjusted individually, adding to the tedium. Notice that I've changed my trigger level to about 80 millivolts. This is so I will still be able to trigger on my signal as I decrease the output amplitude from my AWG. Since I've already qualified this device under test, I know the exact marker output settings necessary to verify my device passes. When I make the adjustment on the AWG, you see the corresponding drop in amplitude of my sent packet and the response from my device under test. Looking at the measurement values, we see that my measured amplitude of my output signal is just under plus or minus 150 millivolts, with my device still responding consistently. This verifies that my device passes the spec as it is able to respond to a signal that is of equal to or greater than plus or minus 150 millivolts differential amplitude. Now, if I decrease my amplitude slightly further, you can see the response from my DUT becomes inconsistent. Here what I've done is lowered the output of my AWG such that my amplitude of my packet is roughly plus minus 130, maybe 120 millivolts. And as you can see, my device under test is no longer able to consistently respond. This is just a functional check to see how far down I can go with my device before it fails. But since we've already verified that my device passes, this portion of the test is not strictly necessary. Lastly, if I decrease my AWG output one more time, such that the output of the packet is roughly plus or minus 100 millivolts, you should see that my device no longer responds. Here looking at our measurement we can see that my output amplitude for my packet is just over plus or minus 100 millivolts. What this shows is that my device is acting correctly and that at values equal to or less than 100 millivolts differential amplitude my device no longer responds to the packet sent to it. This video concludes our series on compliance testing for USB 2.0 high-speed devices. This concludes the receiver sensitivity test procedure for USB 2.0 high-speed devices, as well as this video series. I hope the information in these videos was informative. As always, for additional information and support on Tektronix equipment and test solutions, please visit our website, www.tech.com support. Thanks, as always, for watching.